the anatomy of the central nervous system is uh, the cellular compounds of the brain. So we could uh, divide uh, the tissue of the brain and also uh, spinal cord uh, according to the dose which are um, making the sensations, computational sensations and uh, also then execution of some effects of the, in the central nervous system. So uh, neurons are those cells which are able to create some impulse so they form some potential which is then conducted and also important is the connection of those neurons together uh, because they are able to process the information and then finally the result of it is some effect some effect of emotion, some effect of a glandular production of gastrointestinal tract or other neuronal uh, activity which could have impact to function of other tissues. So the second population are called neuroglia and the neuroglia Neuroglia cells are they which are supporting the function of neurons. We can divide them into the several groups. One of a cell is not real glia, even if it is called microglia. Microglia, if you remember from the first semester, macroglia is one of the important parts of. Uh, uh, macrophages system because it is able to phagocytize uh, the rests of cells and uh, foreign uh, particles and then it is a part of a, a monocytar population and then it is also a part of a mesenchymal uh, organs or it is a cell of mesenchyma or origin. So the last four, they are real neuroglia cells and they are divided into the astrocytes, which are the most important in the maintenance of the inner environment of the neuro uh, tissues because it is able to transport glucose to maintain the flux of glucose into the neurons and then also they are very important in the form formation of a blood-brain barrier. So blood-brain barrier is one of the most important protection uh, uh, conditions for the neural system. They have also important function because they are able to liquidate, so phagocytosis of a rest of non-useful synapses because the brain has the most, uh, the most energy uh, used is for synapses function. So then they, which are not useful, not needed, they are phagocytized. Uh, here is a failed. They also able form a scare of a neural tissue. And then the rest uh, of glia, are oligodendrocytes. We know that they are forming uh, myelin sheaths of neurons. They are able to create this uh, unique uh, cable, uh, which is uh, useful for saltatory spread of uh, impulses of uh, action potential. And the rest two. Ependymal cells and choroid plexus cells, they are uh, relatives uh, because choroid plexus cells are then uh, derivates of ependymal cells and they are uh, lining uh, the inner surface of a ventricular system. Uh, one cell ependymal of a free and the choroid plexus, they are able to secrete, to create cerebral spinal fluid. So even the neurons are different. So here we have a typical uh, central nervous system neurons. This one is uh, 
uh, typical projection. This is association because it has long axon, long axon because this is able to transmit the information for long distance. So those are typical cells which are pyramidal, typically motor cells with long, again long axon to be able to transmit the information from a presental gyrus to the anterior horns of a spinal cord. This is a purkinje or Parkinje. Parkinje cells of cerebellum, again, association, very important association uh, neurons. And the last one, I, uh, they which are in a retina. So long dendrite, long axon, bipolar cells of retina. So, those are several neurons, but all of them need uh, astrocytal help to maintain the function because they need oxygen, they need glucose, they need stable uh, environment according to the ionic, ionic uh, compounds of the fluid. So, uh, the neurons we know that they have an extreme ratio between surface and volume because they are very long. They have a many, many uh, processes with arborization of the dendrites and typically one axon, which could be very, very long, 70 centimeters, for example. And then they are equipped with the synapses. The axon has synapses to some other parts in brain they are group, uh, in groups, are grouped in clusters. Those clusters are named in a central nervous system. system. Nuclei, columnas. Columnas are in a, typically in, a, in a, a spinal cord and also in a brain and the strata. Strata layers in a telencephalon. So, because they, those neurons, fire the synapses, fire the axons, and this is the most important uh, consumer of energy. So even if they are unipolar, multipolar, pseudo-unipolar, so they need very high energy. So the axons then are connected with the other cells on several paths and then we have something which is known as a synapse. Synapse is an important connection of two neurons with two important things. They have a so-called synaptic button And then we have a synaptic cleft, and, and then we have a receptor, receptor site. So important is that uh, the axon has creation of some substance, which is typically in endoplasmatic reticulum, and with axonal transportation, their substances the tubular system are transported into the place of synapse where we have vesicles which are filled of these uh, of those uh, substances and after some electric potential is coming the electric potential coming in milliseconds are, are able to release those vesicles with so-called exocytosis and uh, substance like acetylcholine, they then are bound to the receptor. And in millisecond, the electric potential is created on next cell. So the, the electric activity is not conducted directly. This is indirectly with this relay. So the 
time of uh, information skip or transportation through the cleft is uh, in uh, about uh, one millisecond. So we have typically the substances which are able to increase the activity of a neuron and decreased activity. So we have some important inhibitory and excitatory substances. So one substance is able to increase the electric activity and the neuron then is prone to create its own at the electric potential. On the other side, the GABA, typically gamma aminobutyric acid, the most important inhibitory substance is decreasing this activity. So when uh, the substance is bound to the receptor, then it has changed electric potential and then it's important also very frequently the substance is released in a more uh, molecules than are needed. The rest should be uh, inactivated and the extracellular inactivation of neurotransmitter could be by activity of acetylcholine esterase, so it's as enzyme, and then also a reuptake made by uh, the exon again, so the rest, which is here not needed, typically in a, a dopamine, they are able to take those molecules back to the axonal path, to the button. And the last mechanism is a real the glial uh, uptake of those substances to clean this cleft to be ready for the next electric transmission. The synapse, uh, we have a two important, two main kind of synapses. One is uh, here typically, it's a synaptic button and then the spike or spine, this spine and spike, it is uh, the receptor side of the synapse and this is a typically transmission of a signal. So then some impulse is coming and then it's transmitted to the next neuron. The situation could be also uh, a little bit different uh, in a synapse which is called side by side, which is seen here. The side by side is also called in French bouton un passage which is something, something like a ventile because this synaptic transmission could maintain the electric state of the axon here and this axon could be blocked or enhanced for the transmission. So then the signal which is going through the, through the axon could be then gated by this button. So this is a typically uh, uh, side where you can you where you can see uh, inhibitory uh, transmission with GABA, so gamma amino butyric acid. So synapses, synapses in general, the firing of synapses is uh, very demanding for energy, and we can distinguish axosomatic which are uh, the axon is transmitted uh, the electric potential directly to the body of the next neuron or it could be axodendritic or axo axonal and those uh, axodendritic and axo axonal are typically those which are maintain uh, the passage of the signal through the uh, axon or dendrite so then they are able to limit the flow of information into the neuron. So then this limitation of inflow of information need be, it, it, it could be needed uh, to prevent overload of information, overload of energy demanding 
and then also uh, it is like in uh, computer you know when we have uh, something which is uh, very demanding of uh, computation power so then it is lasting too much or the computer is uh, overheated etc the same situation as the neurons so this is a schema from uh, Grace Anatomy, very nice, uh, which is showing uh, the typical uh, typical uh, things which are able uh, able to maintain the uh, connection and maintain the flux of the information through the dendrite or into the into the into the body. Now we turn to glia. Glia, uh, or neuroglia, we know that we have uh, uh, some cells. We know that microglia is something different, something different because it's macrophage. And then the other, what is, what is function of them? Here we have a neuron. A neuron has neuronal activity, neuronal functions. And then we have astrocytes. Astrocytes are able to maintain the activity of neurons because they are able to transmit some information, transmit some impulses into the, into the uh, neuron and they are able to involve the activity of neurons but not with the action potential. They use some ionic channels and those ionic channels typically maintaining calcium ca channels and calcium concentration inside and outside the neuron. They are able to inhibit the function of neurons or they are able to support them. So astrocytes. Here are two astrocytes and those astrocytes are taking Typically, this one, some products which are in the blood cells, typically glucose, and through those particles, they are able to stream the flux of glucose into the neuron or into the other cells. But they are able also to take some information from other surrounding cells, typically from meninges or from ependema. And those glial cells which are in contact with the surface are called glia limitans. Those glia limitans are covering the, the own surface of the brain even if it is uh, towards to the ventricle, even if it is uh, towards to the meningeal layer, and they are uh, isolating also the neurons from the real surface of a central nervous system. So, so astrocytes are very important. Uh, they uh, support ionic or ionic exchanges, glucose transportation exchange. And they are able also, important, to maintain the flow, the flux of glucose. Because uh, they modulate the activity of the neurons. And the connection between vessels, astrocytes and neurons is called also neuropil. Neuropil is a very huge space in a neural activity and we can say today that uh, glia and neurons are in, rela uh, in relation one to one about. So this is a very huge, very huge number of glial cells in the brain. Some they are specialized in neurohypo uh, neurohypophysis, etc. And uh, the maintaining of a flux is through so-called neurovascular coupling. Neurovascular coupling is a very important 
important term. What this means? When you have increased activity of neurons, to be able to be active, they need substrates, typically glucose and uh, CO uh, and uh, oxygen, O2. But more than they are active, more they are consuming the glucose, so then they are consuming too much, so then the blood should be able in one, two milliseconds to increase the flux of glucose through the bloodstream, so then the astrocytes are able to transmit back the information from tissue, especially with a higher concentration of CO2. So when you have a very increased CO2 concentration in a tissue, according to the consume of the glucose, then the CO2 is stimulating the increased size of the vessels, an increased flux of the blood and then intake of the glucose by the tissue. So this is a mechanism which is very helpful in the brain because in milliseconds when you have to switch on and switch off some centers. So this reactivity of the tissue is again related with the activity of the astrocytes. So for oligodendrocytes we know they, they are forming uh, myelin sheaths. Typically oligodendrocytes uh, form more, uh, more uh, fibers. An ependema will be discussed uh, in the next uh, part of lecture about uh, ventricular system. So, uh, I have said that astrocytes are very important in uh, the mechanism which is called blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier is uh, extremely important because proteins which are our own, for example, albumin, or some other, from other uh, organisms which are during infection in our body. So they are able to circulate in blood and they are typically spreading into the almost all tissues except central nervous system and peripheral nerves. So this is a very important protection against those uh, substances and proteins are typically uh, soluble in water. So endothel and astrocytes, footlets, they have a tight connections. Here we have uh, those footlets or buttons of astrocytes. And they are covering vessels. Between, they, uh, between them, astrocytes and endothelial cells, we have a several layers. They are basal, or basement, uh, membrane, basement, uh, lamina, which is a uh, uh, basement membrane of a vascular capillary wall. And then also we have here pia mater, and it is also the tissue which has basement membrane or basal lamina. So the way of O2 or glucose is through those structures. O2 is a diffusible but glucose is transportable through those membranes and taken by astrocytes. Because tight junctions between endothelium they are not able, those macromolecules like protein, to escape outside from vascular space and they are also not able to pass these membranes, those membranes, which forming several layers of a, a barrier between blood and brain.
So this barrier limited molecular exchange, especially macromolecular exchange of protein origin. The barrier is less effective around ventricles. It has some consequences, and I will uh, show you what. And then it is important that there are no limitations of exchange of lipophilic substances. Lipophilic substances are those which are soluble in, in lipoid, lipoid material. And, uh, for example, they are very important in general anesthesia. So, in general anesthesia, colleagues use typically chloroform in past, in the past, or uh, uh, gas of Eden. So, this is substance which is soluble in uh, lipoid tissue, typically lipoid, tish, uh, lipoid substance is a, a layer or bilayer of uh, phospholipids and they are able to pass those barriers, but proteins not. Why proteins not? Because proteins could impair the function of the microenvironment of a neural cells, so they are able to impair the function of the whole system. So this is a blood-brain barrier, very important. Why? We have it to protect neuronal functions. And why they, those cells are able to do it? Because every substance which is going into the neuron has to be transported by the astrocyte. So then, now, liquor spaces. We can distinguish liquor spaces. One space is a ventricular system. And then, from ventricular system, the fluid is flowing into the cisterns. and subarachnoidal spaces. So this is inside the brain and this cisterns and sub cisterns are part of subarachnoid spaces. This is outside. And then we have a very important a place where it's created and when it is a resorption. So this is a, some process which is called also circulation of a cerebral spinal fluid. And the cerebral spinal fluid is the outer environment from, for the central nervous system. This is something like archaic C because it is a solution of electrolytes, solution of uh, proteins, a little bit cells, in which the brain is flowing. This is a mechanical, this is a chemical, an electrical protection of the whole central nervous system. Now we turn to inside spaces to those which are called ventricular system. So ependema. What is ependema? Ependema is a lining, single layer lining in ventricular system and a central channel of a spinal cord. They are equipped, those cells, they are cubic or And they are equipped with microvilli, and they also some hair-like structures, which are called cilia. Those microvilli and microcilia could help with the motion to make the fluid flow. CSF flow 
is very important because the, flow, the fluid is created inside the ventricle and then the outflow is important to protect the brain from overpressure going from inside. So ependema has a four types. Four types, they are where the gray matter is, then the lining is a cuboid cells with too much cilia and microvilli. So below them is an important subependymal zone where are progenitor cells in rodents. What is rodents? Do you know what is rodents? Rats, squirrels and the other. Typically in rodents, in the last 10 years, they, our colleagues found that there are some progenitor cells. What is progenitor cells? It's a primitive cell which has not completely differentiated. And then it's able to differentiate in the future. So they are some precursors of cells. So this is a very important uh, finding uh, that probably somewhere in the brain we have uh, something what is possible to be uh, regenerated but uh, it's not functional in primates but in, pri uh, in rodents probably it is some potential to, to create new uh, neurons from those but it's a grey matter so ependymal zone is very important so then we have a white matter lining, this is a flat, rare cilia, and no subependymal zone, and then this is also, uh, what is uh, differentiated? What is different between those zones? Well, you can imagine that we have a, a hippocampal formation, and hippocampal formation is a gray matter which is facing the cerebrospinal fluid, which is localized in a ventricle. So there, those uh, ependymal cells with the microvilli are localized here. But we have some structures which are also prone to the cerebrospinal fluid in ventriculus, like fornix, which is white matter. On fornix, there are only those flat cells. But then we have an important uh, or organs which are called in general, circumventricular organs, important organs which are able to take some information from chemical compounds in the cerebrospinal fluid or in blood and then they are able to secrete something. So we will have the list of them, but typically are the eminencia mediana, hypothalami, subcommissural organs, Organum vasculosum and, and area postrema. And um, some authors, in some books, you can see that uh, circumventricular organ is also choroid plexus. Choroid plexus choroid plexus is lined by choroid epithelium. Choroid epithelium is the derivate of ependema, but uh, it's a little bit different because they have gap junctions and desmosomes. So this is a very tight connection between them. So this is very important. So in uh, layers of ependema, and then we have the tissue of the brain, where is we know glial limitans. So there is a very tiny, more virtual space, which is called subependymal space. It's a typically space where it could be edema when the patient or not completely edema, it could be uh, the imbibition 
of the tissue with the cerebrospinal fluid when the patient has a disease which is called hyp uh, hydrocephalus with uh, hypertension in the ventricular system. So I have said that we have a, one specialized organ which is called choroid plexus. Choroid plexus is created at the roof of neural tube at the vesicle which is at the tip at the head tip of a neural tube. Uh, there, in the roof, are no neurons. This plexus is the site of creation, of production of cerebrospinal fluid. So cerebrospinal fluid is uh, created at the roof of the ventricle. And uh, choroid plexus is a specialized gland. If we compare the gland, which is in, uh, somewhere in a GIT, this is an inversion of a tissue, and the lining is here. And they have uh, products like saliva, or mucous substances, which is released, released into the lumen of GIT. But choroid plexus is a different. Choroid plexus is aversion, not inversion. This is aversion. So it's a papillary structure on which surface is a lining and the production is outside into the ventricular system. So it is an aversion type of a gland. The system is that this is tissue of the brain and tissue of the brain is uh, covered by ependema and the ependema then is following to the layer this violet is pia mater and this double layer is covering the roof of the ventricle and then is follow, following into the, those papillary structures which have inside the web or network of capillaries and on the surface of those papillary structure called papillary uh, choroid plexus. The cells are changed and you can see here those black points. They are tight junctions. So then those cells which are on the choroid plexus are called choroid epithelium. Choroid epithelium is derivative of ependema. They have a multiple microvilli or brush. So the brushing is a place where it's secreting the cerebrospinal fluid. So then here is a ventricle. And here is important. This is a arachnoid. And this is a subarachnoid space. So here we have a outside. And here we have inside fluid spaces. So this is a ventricle and this is a subarachnoid space. This is a microphotograph from Tima, or I don't know if it's a microphotograph or the image painted. So this is the villar structure of a choroid plexus. Inside you have a vessels, and on the surface, this is tightly connected cells with a brush surface, and then the CSF is created by those cells and then created inside a ventricle. 
So the relation of pia mater and plexus choroideus. We, here we have uh, two sections. This is a coronary. Uh, in the region of a third ventricle and lateral ventricles. And in uh, reality, the telencephalon and the encephalon are parts of a prosencephalon. I have said last lecture that the uh, telencephalon is created or growing like a mushroom. And this is the reason why the roof of the ventricle is then forming such a strange epsilon, epsilon structure. And everywhere we have something which is called choroid fissure. Choroid fissure is the real roof of a neural tube, even in a temporal, this is a temporal lobe, it's facing the midline, from lateral to midline. Yeah, because could you imagine the mushroom where they have a, the inner side? So it's a a rolled, overrolled with the overgrowing. So the overgrowing of a telencephalon causing that the roof is not at the top, not outside, but rolled inside. And in choroid fissure, you can observe that this is a pia mater. And the pia mater is then facing this choroid fissure. And inside is the second lining, which is a lining of a ventricle, which is choroid plexus. Choroid plexus derivate of ependema. So the fluid is then created here, or here, or here. And it's a filling the ventricular system. So this is an inside, and this is an outside. So here we have hippocampus, hippocampus and hippocampal formation. So here is a subiculum. So subiculum is facing subarachnoid space, dentate gyrus also facing subarachnoidal space, but here hippocampal gray matter is facing intraventricular space. So then they have different kinds of lining. Choroid plexus position. Choroid plexus is a long strip and the strip is in lateral ventricle lining along the hippocampal formation and it is at the original roof of the secular or vesicula of the rostral brain. At the third ventricle, it's lying on the roof. And you can observe here something which is forming such a like M structure. This is due to Third and lateral ventricles are in, this, in the star common ventricle and during uh, the differentiation of a prosencephalon into the diencephalon and telencephalon, they is growing like the mentioned mushroom and then this is only like only one choroid plexus lying through the those three ventricles. Even here it is a broken. The similar situation is in the fourth ventricle. Also here it's creating some M-like letter. 
and the fourth ventricle has a very specialized situation because from fourth ventricle the cerebrospinal fluid is fluid is flowing into the subarachnoid space to the outside environment and lateral parts of those choroid plexuses or one plexus is prone to be localized outside the ventricle in lateral apertures. The choroid plexus is fixed in something which is called tenia. Do you know from Latin what is a, which animal is a tenia? So tenia solium, some parasites. So it's a strip yeah, in English. Those strips are localized in temporomesial region. So it's a, on the temporal uh, structures which are called hippocampus and hippocampal and then those tenia are going into the third ventricle and in third ventricle they are called tenia palami so those tenias are lateral and medial they are choroidea and fornices so because the choroid plexus are fixed to the structures of a hippocampus and we know that from hippocampus from fimbria is then created the following fornix cerebri so those structures are typical in human larger typically larger in the temporal horns and lateral ventricles, but in uh, more primitive quadrupoles, like in sauria, they have a sauric brain. Then, then it's uh, important that they are fixed along the remnants of it. So, uh, tenia jacolomini or or other uh, indusium griseum. So, those remnants of this sauric sauric brain. So then we have to discuss the blood liquor barrier. We have heard about the blood brain barrier. Blood liquor barrier is a very also important because it's the protection of a macromolecular exchange between blood and liquor. And it's equipped the choroid plexus by tight junctions between choroid plexus lining cells. And this is their situation. Those are connections which are not providing the flux of a fluid from subependymal space into the ventricular. But it's important in choroid plexus, because in choroid plexus we need to have some flux of a tissue, a flux of a fluid. Uh, from vascular space into the interstitial space. So then it is a uh, different. So this is a normal brain tissue and this is a choroid plexus. And choroid plexus has to be able to have some intake of water, intake of some molecules because those cells are producting the fluid. On the other side, the cells of ependema are not tightly connected, so then the fluid is able to pass between them into the superficial uh, layer of the brain. So this is very important in those situations when the um, production of the fluid is too high, to or the flow outside from the brain, from ventricular system, is blocked. So then the increased pressure in uh, cerebral spinal fluid spaces in ventricular system uh, means that the fluid is escaping into the surrounding tissue around the ventricles, uh, which is typical for the compensation of hydrocephalus, very, very dangerous situation. 
I have said that the choroid plexus is uh, relative to circumventricular organs, some authors, typically in uh, German speaking, uh, they count uh, the uh, choroid plexus into the circumventricular organs. Those circumventricular organs, they have a typically lack of a blood-brain barrier. Uh, it's not developed or it's also not needed. Uh, now it's uh, the advantage because we have organs which are able to take some substances from blood or from uh, fluid inside the ventricular system and uh, to make some reaction. They have a sensory and secretory role. So they are able to obtain some information, but they also have some molecules which could be secreted to involve some production of other, other tissues. So we have those which are localized around ventricles, except one, except area postrema. They are localized around the third ventricle. Area postrema is a pair organ which is localized uh, in the point where is uh, starting the central channel. So the, the lower part of the fourth ventricle. So it's important for detection of toxin in a food or food, uh, the substances subs, uh, uh, which are resorbed in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, they are important with uh, food aversion, nausea, and because this is related very, very close to the centers uh, of, uh, of the uh, pharyngeal, for the pharyngeal muscles for ninth and tenth nerve. So then it is very important for creation of vomitus. I have said in some of last century, uh, last lectures that uh, it's a point where very frequently when the tumor is growing here in a, in a cerebellum could be uh, directly involved uh, the vomiting of patients who have a tumor here in this localization. So this is an area postrema, except vomiting, it is a very important for cardiorespiratory homeostasis. Why? Because the substances typically uh, dissolved in the blood or dissolved in the cerebrospinal fluid could be important, especially when they have very increased CO2, that we have uh, to uh, breathe more intense. Uh, and also for cardiovascular uh, apparat to be ready for running, etc., and to be adapted to running. So this is also cardiorespiratory homeostasis uh, center, very important. So this is in a fourth ventricle. All other are around the third ventricle. So uh, we have uh, some important, some of them we know, neurohypophysis and pineal organ from last lectures. Neurohypophysis and part of a tuberal, tuberal uh, nuclei. So they are site of uh, production or snot production of uh, releasing of uh, oxytocin and vasopressin into the blood because uh, those are created in a supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. So this is a neurohypophysis. The pineal gland, pineal organ, is uh, creating melatonin, we know, and it's also important in maintenance of biorhythms, circadian, typically circadian uh, biorhythms. So then the rest of them. So, eminencia mediana. Eminencia mediana is uh, something which is very close, very close to uh, infundibulum of hypophysis, and it is able this organ is able to mediate releasing hormone. So, uh, this is something which is uh, able, and you can see that it's uh, near to optic nerve, to maintain the production in tuberal, uh, tuberal nuclei. And important is that they those cells have melatonin receptors. So then, melatonin could maintain 
the activity of uh, Eminencia Mediana, and then Eminencia Mediana then is able to maintain this, uh, the production of uh, neuro and adenohypophysis. Next thing. Uh, organum vasculosum lamine terminalis. So, uh, vascular organ of terminal lamina. Terminal lamina is something which is at the tip of a neural tube. And at the tip of the neural tip, we have a very important organ which is able to react to differences in osmosis of a f a fluid. Osmosis of a fluid in ventricle, osmosis in a vascular system. So then, when we have an increased osmo osmotic pressure, so then we have then here very important stimulant, which is maintaining the thirst to intake the, uh, the fluid, water. Subcommissural organ. Subcommissural organ is uh, the organ, uh, sorry, here, which is at the site where the cerebrospinal fluid is going into the mesencephalic aqueductus. And this is an idle site where the CSF production could be under control. So, this is production control, so the volume, and also the composition control. And also it is a very important organ, which is localized in commissura posterior, where is produced transtyretin. Transtyretin is a transportive molecule, which is transporting, you can see, tyretin, thyroid hormones, and then also retinol, vitamin A. So this is an important molecule which is uh, part of a so, cladramer and this macromeric structure is able to transport this. And probably you will hear in the future in cardiology that or pathology that there is exists some disease which is called amyloidosis cardiac amyloidosis, which is one of them, is this transtyretin, so secreted and not very well compounding together transtyretin, which is here, secreted here. So why it is here secreted? Probably because it is the control of composition of our uh, fluid of our, of our organism, the composition. Then the more transported thyroid hormones means to increase the protein synthesis and the metabolic activity of, all, of almost all tissues. So this was subcommissural organ. The last one, the last one is a subfornical. This is a fornix, and here we have a commissura anterior. Two, this is a columna of it and here is a subfornical organ which is a very close to foramina monroi we will hear about them and this is an organ which is very vascularized again is able to relate uh, to react to changes in osmosis of a blood osmosis of a cerebrospinal fluid and it's a very important for energetic homeostasis. It has a very important input and close topical relation to this structure and to this. What is this? This is a rinencephalon and here is a nucleus anterior thalami and also fornix Singulum and other things. So then you can see that it is a very close to limbic system. And limbic system, uh, the original function, is a system which is maintaining the intake of food, intake of water. And then this organ is also called, you can hear about 
the organ of thirst. So, those are circumventricular organs. They are very small, not very prominent, but they are playing the key role in the sustainable environment of the, or of the organism. And when you can see that they are very close to the limbic system, very close to hypothalamus, so this is a key, key structures in maintaining of our microenvironment in a whole body. So, important thing. I will be glad if you will remember this and this close relation to uh, our behavior guided by limbic system because everything even if we are human are only maintained by the, those primitive systems originally for food intake, fight, defense and a breeding. So now we go to the Liquor spaces. Liquor spaces. Liquor spaces are divided into main compartments. I have said one is inside ventricles, so intraventricular, the second is outside. So cerebrospinal fluid, liquor cerebrospinalis, is produced by choroid plexus. And daily about 500 milliliters. So every day is produced 500 milliliters. The volume of the intraventricular system is about 250 milliliters of the whole cerebrospinal fluid system. So per hour it is created about 25 milliliters, and in day this is exchanged twice, about twice the whole cerebrospinal fluid. So it's a quite high needs for circulation. This circulation is the fluid is going from lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. In lateral ventricle we have a choroid plexus. We have also choroid plexus in third ventricle. So then the fluid is also created here. So the production of three ventricles then is flowing here into the aqueductus mesencephaly. And from aqueductus it is flowing into the fourth ventricle. Where is the fourth choroid plexus and also is producing fluid. So then in the fourth ventricle the flux of the fluid should be higher than in a cr more cranial spaces. And here we have a two apertures laterally and one dorsally, from which the fluid is escaping to the outside space of liquid spaces, which are called subarachnoid and also cistern. Subarachnoid spaces then enabling the circulation of the fluid around the brain and finally in a specialized organs which are called villi arachnoidales or granulaciones arachnoidales. So arachnoid granulations which contains some villous structures, there the fluid is resorbed into the blood. So the cerebrospinal fluid is a derivate of blood and then is back resorbed into the blood. The improportion between creation, flux and resorption makes a problem. This problem is called hydrocephalus. The hydrocephalus could be overproduction very rarely in a prochoroid plexus due to tumors, due to infection, or it could be blockage somewhere typically in aqueductus, 
then it is a, in one compartment, enlargement, increased pressure. So then we have a one ventricular, biventricular, three ventricular, or four ventricular hydrocephalus, which is so-called closed hydrocephalus. Then we have a second one, which is communicating, and it is a problem of resorption. So it could be a problem of creation, flux, and resorption. And all of them could have impact to the function of a neural system because the increased pressure could decrease the possibility of neurons to fire because to the decreased perfusion, direct compression, direct changes, etc. So the hydrocephalus is very important. Some active hydrocephalus, which could be developing in several hours, could kill a patient in several hours. But they are some chronic hydrocephali, which are typically those with problems with resorption, which are developing for several years. And f uh, finally, they have uh, some uh, more psychiatric problems in the patients, very similar to the Alzheimer's disease or something else. Uh, leading to atrophy of uh, neural, uh, neural system. So this is very important to know the hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a one uh, complex of diseases and causes could be very different. So the ventricular system consists of a four ventricles and one tube. The tube is called aqueductus mesencephaly. This is a lateral ventricle Lateral ventricle has this strange shape. This is a lateral. This is a third ventricle. This eye here, it is adhesion between thalami. Then this is aqueductus. And this is a fourth ventricle. The last part is uh, here. This is a central channel of the spinal cord. I have said it is not in all patients continuous, could be disrupted, but it's uh, filled by cerebral spinal fluid too. The blood, uh, the blood, the fluid is escaping this way into the subarachnoid space, and the third direction is here from fourth ventricle. So when we look from the top. Here we have a lateral ventricle. From lateral ventricle the fluid is going this way. This and this here is a foramen interventriculare generally called Monroe because the name of the altar is Monroe, similarly to Marilyn Monroe, but Marilyn Monroe has E at the end of the name, so it's Monroe. This foramen Monroe is a communication between lateral and third ventricle. So those ventricles are communicating left and right lateral through the third ventricle. Even if you can imagine that this is in reality one ventricle in prosencephalon in development and also when you will hear about the uh, congenital defect which is called holoprosencephaly then you can see that those patients have only one ventricle in the prosencephalon. And prosencephalon is divided in human and mammals in telencephalon and diencephalon. But this is a one common ventricle, one common secular structure in the start. So this is a third and lateral ventricle. So foramen munro. Then here we have aqueductus, and this is a fourth ventricle. 
And here is one way, the second way, and the third way outside to the subarachnoid spaces. So then, the circulation of a fluid, I have said, from lateral ventricles into the third ventricle, yeah, here into the third ventricle, from third ventricle into the fourth ventricle through aqueductus, and outside, and this way, to the subarachnoid spaces. The motion of a fluid is due to motion of cilia, motion of a villi, but mostly it is the closed system with only one way out and the brain is pulsating because the blood which is filling the brain makes the brain to make pulses. And those changes of size of volume of the brain pumping the fluid also. So this is one way out. When the fluid is escaping, then again you have a skull which is rigid and inside is pulsing brain and this pulsing brain is then pumping the fluid which is going around the whole brain, around all directions and filling the spaces and generally the fluid is resorbed in those arachnoidal granulations. The same way the fluid is then pumped into the spinal channel in subarachnoid spaces in a, uh, in a vertebral column. And there are also resorption sites in plexuses around the, around the spinal cord. So this is the main mechanism. The pulsation of the central nervous system is then pumping the, pumping the fluid. So what's the system? The name of those. So ventriculus lateralis, lateral ventricles. Those are here. They are paired. They are two. Then is ventriculus tertius, third ventricle. Then aqueductus sylvi, aqueduct, or called aqueductus mesencephali. So mesencephalic duct or sylvian duct is the name for aqueductus. And the last part of the ventricular system is a ventriculus quartus, the fourth ventricle. Lateral ventricles. Lateral ventricles, they have uh, several compartments. You have seen the strange shape, and we have to differentiate so-called cornu, horns. Frontal, anterius. Then we have occipital or posterior. And inferior or temporal. So those are three horns. Then we know that this is a foramen interventricularium monroi, which is communication between ventricle, lateral and third. And between two ventricles, you can see here this structure, two lamellas, which are forming, look here, this is a septum pellucidum. Pellucidum because it's translucent when you see it. Those are two laminas, two laminas, two laminas of the roof of primitive ventricle, and when the brain is growing, and it's also like a walnut, and you can see that those two parts are close together in walnut. So then, those parts of ventricles are facing together and in between them is a space which is called cavum septi pellucidi. This cavum is this, uh, this spelt, this is a very tiny space here in between, 
two lamellas. And this is filled by the fluid. In almost all adult people, you cannot see the spout, even if this. But in some adults, about 2% uh, of them, there is a uh, larger space, which could be along ventricles. And uh, when you will see the ultrasound of the fetus, in 100 cases, there is a space filled by the fluid. So this is a cavum septi pellucidi. So between structures which are called corpus or body or cella media, they are outlined by fornix. They are divided from thalamus by choroid fissure and this is space called cella media or body. The space between occipital horn, temporal horn and body is called then trigonum and also atrium, trigon atrium. So this is a space between occipital horn, temporal horn, and cella media. How it is uh, here on this image? It's much more easy to imagine. So this is a frontal horn. This is an occipital horn. This is a temporal horn. Here is a trigon or atrium. And here is a body. And this is a foramen monroi. Yeah. So frontal horn, and between them, there is a septum pellucidum. Septum pellucidum is a very important landmark when we assess magnetic resonance, because one of the most information well, most important information obtained from CT on MR in critical ill patients is how is displaced the septum pellucidum because septum pellucidum is in idle midline. In idle midline is only in a normal situation. When you have a patient with some tumor, some bleeding, the septum pellucidum is then shifted towards to the other side and the shift is very important. When we have a shift more than one centimeter, so it is in a critical situation, those patients need to have craniotomy and to rapidly decrease the intracranial pressure to uh, protect the life of the patient. So it is a very critical when the shift is more than one centimeter. So, yeah, here we have the septum pellucidum in this localization. This is frontal horn, this is a temporal horn, occipital horn, trigon, and body. And here, foramen. So, description of it. The cerventricle, this is a cleft like, spout like structure. Typically vertically localized in the midline. So it's roofed by choroid plexus, we know it. Laterally, we have a thalami, and in between them is a adhesion. The bottom anterior is formed by hypothalamus, we know it. Here is a corpus mammillare, tuber tubercinereum, corpus mammillare, and infundibulum. And here also, this is uh, chiasma. And dorsal is a subthalamus, and also we can see here epiphysis. And what is important then, dorsal caudale is infundibular osteum of mesencephalic duct. The communication with lateral ventriculus is behind 
uh, dividing columnae fornices. So when the fornix has the anterior arms, there is behind them the foramen, and very near is uh, commissura anterior, anterior commissure, the primitive communication between the rinencephalic parts of the brain. And so the foramen interventriculi is dividing fornix and nucleus anterior talum. So where is, this is MR. Third ventricle is here and here. This is an interthalamic adhesion. And here, the same, is here, third ventricle. Here you can see foramina monroi. This is a lateral ventricle. And this between is septum pellucidum and this button and here this structure and here this structure is a fornix and here is a commissure uh, anterior commissure so this is also third ventricle the third ventricle is again idle in midline and the shift of it, it's a very, very critical. But um, because it is a, in the incisura tentori, when it is a shift, it is a, sometimes very, very close to a severe damage of the brain. Aqueductus mesencephaly. Aqueduct. Mesencephalic duct. Sylvian duct. All those names. So, Sylvie. So this is a very short structure, short structure, which is in one, two millimeters in diameter. A newborn, it has 12, adult about 20 millimeters, so very short. It's a dorsally to posterior commissure. Here is a posterior commissure. And here, dorsally from it is a tectum. What is tectum? Tectum is lamina quadrigeminalis. And then also, here we have a colliculi. Yeah, in mesencephalon. So, tectum is dorsally. Anteriorly is the second one, which is a tegmentum. Dorsa caudally, it enters fourth ventricle at the level of pons and mesencephalon interface. The fourth ventricle then, so aqueduct is very easy to understand, where is it? It's easy. The fourth ventricle is tent-like structure which is over the rhomboid fossa and below Cerebellum. It's a following of aqueductus. Rostrali is a scene. Pons, medulla, here mesencephalon, so it's about the pons and medulla. And dorsal is cerebellum. And from fourth ventricle, we have uh, two apertures laterally and one dorsally. And in a fourth ventricle, here we have round this space, area postrema. The fourth ventricle has uh, three apertures. One is paired, is uh, typically called lateral. And again, according to the author's Lushke, easy to remember, lateral Lushke. One is medial, impaired, and it is a medial, margin D, lateral Lushke. And through the Lushke foramen is 
facing the choroid plexus, the subarachnoidal space. So sometimes it could be problem in diagnostics because it's enhancing. We have discussions sometimes about this is a tumor, this is the infection, it is the only choroid plexus, what is it? So this is an important thing. So then, the fluid escaping into the subarachnoidal space. We know that we have epidural, subdural spaces. They were discussed last uh, semester. They are between skull and meninges, and meninges and meninges. And then we have layer of arachnoidea here, blue, and pink, which is a pia. Between pia mater and arachnoida, there is a subarachnoidal space filled by the cerebrospinal fluid. And then also we have a smaller spaces, which is subpial space, which is between pia mater and the brain. So we know that it is a subpial space. Subpial spaces are called robin virchow spaces. They are filled also by the fluid. Sometimes it is a, sometimes a cerebrospinal fluid, sometimes it's a filtration of a, of a tissue. For us now is an important day superarachnoid space. In superarachnoid space, they are coated vessels, those coated, coated vessel, vessels are facing subarachnoid space. And when you can Im uh, Imagine that the vessel could have an aneurysm, and the aneurysm is exploding. The blood could escape into the subarachnoid spaces. Subarachnoid spaces are very, very important. So here we have a meningeal spaces on, a, on CT. I can show you here also. This is a septum pellucidum. Yeah, and of course, ventricle is not seen. And here is a midline. And it's about one and a half centimeter with epidural hematoma. So this is a critical shift. But uh, now we have a subarachnoid space is here filled by the blood due to ruptured aneurysm. So subarachnoid bleeding due to ruptured aneurysm is a typically in liquor spaces outside the brain. It has important impact to the function of brain because the blood cause spasms of vessels it could cause the pain led by the typically ophthalmic nerve felt like extreme pain of the head and the second more advanced and delayed complication is a spasm and spasms cause the hyperperfusion or ischemia of the superficial parts of the brain, which could cause severe, severe complication of it. So, play, please remember that subarachnoid bleeding from aneurysm could cause the filling of a subarachnoid liquor spaces by blood. So, uh, subarachnoid space. It's outside the brain and spine between pia mater and arachnoidea and it's important for CSF circulation. Here only one motion power is pulsation of the brain, blood and brain, because blood is also pulsing in vessels. So then we have cisterns. This is a horrible list of cisterns probably from a first look, horrible names. But when we look at the names, they are named according to the localization when they are, where they are. So the fluid is escaping here from a fourth ventricle, this three ways, and this filling. Uh, first is a great cistern, cisterna magna, great celebro. Cistern, then the fluid is filling those spaces. Then we have cisterna premedularis. Premedular cistern is a, in the front of a spinal cord and medulla oblongata. Then 
we have a prepontine cistern which is localized in the front of pons cerebri then the fluid is flowing into the cistern which is called interpeduncular here dorsally is filled this space where is vermis so vermiana and filling this space important which is seen here and here then escaping to this those three are the general name is cistern of the great cerebral vein cisterna venae magnae but in clinical we use quadrigeminal or superior cistern this quadrigeminal is facing quadrigeminal plate so tectum mesencephaly and this tectum is close to the wedge shaped incisura tentori and this space has to be seen on CT and MR again in a hyperpressure in a supratentorial space because this is a place where we can see compression of a brain stem so this is a one important the second important interpeduncular and also cistern of the lamina terminalis terminal lamina cistern those two are important also in the bleeding for aneurysms because aneurysms are localized typically in those localizations and what is important here also this lamina terminalis where is the organ of lamina terminalis also is a close to the intraventricular space and this is a tiny membrane which could be ruptured due to increased pressure of bleeding from aneurysm and then is a way how the blood is able to enter the intraventricular system in bleeding so this is a uh, the point of minor resistance so those are cisterns uh, then uh, cisterns which are on the base of the of the of the brain then the blood uh, then the csf is flowing around the uh, corpus callosum is so pericalosa then uh, it's escaping along the brain into the cistern which is called cistern fossa sylvi fossa sylvi is a uh, insular region and then is flowing along gyri etc etc yeah the bleeding here is seen also the aneurysm this is a giant aneurysm extremely extremely large aneurysm which is not common like b this typically they have a three four millimeters even then they are able to be ruptured so this is a blood escaping into the this is a in a brain but you can see how the blood is able to fill those spaces this is subarachnoid space here is also this is interpeduncular and here we have what is it this is a aqueductus and this is a mesencephalon and around mesencephalon we have important spaces dorsally it's a quadri a quadrigeminal cistern and here which is not seen in the sagittal view this is a cistern which is called ambience and here you can see compression of those structures edema this is a horrible situation so this is a moribund patient which is dying in several minutes because it's incurable bleeding incurable state of the patient which will have in a several hours brain ischemia compression of brainstem brain death so resorption the last point of existence of a cerebrospinal fluid arachnoidal granulations 
Arachnoidal granulations are villar structures which are prominent into the venous system and this venous system is a dural sinus typically superior sagittal sinus the space of arachnoidea filled by CSF is a prominent covered by meningeal at the tip by trabecular part of arachnoidea and through those spaces is filtrated then back the fluid into the blood so this is a blood blood space so fluid is escaping into this granulation and through this granulation is filtrated back to the to the blood so again here this barrier it's not free fluid flow into the vascular system so the resorption or circulation disorders could be caused by some blockage so here is a tumor or it's a tumor like this is called cyst of foramen monroe a blocking the outflow from lateral ventricles so here flow, uh, ventricles are enlarged also here are enlarged due to the other cause you can see this enlargement and probably you can see this uh, gray halo around so this is that due to overpressure the fluid is escaping into the surrounding tissue it's called imbibition or transependymal ultrafiltration of a cerebrospinal fluid it seems to be important because this is a decompensation of uh, and the cause of it is a tumor which is invading the third ventricle here on the base so it was uh, some primitive neurectoderma tumor so this is causing enlargement of the lateral ventricle and this escaping so the fluid is not able to escape from the ventricles into the supracranial spaces so it was the fluid circulation now we turn to vessels to know vascular supply of the brain is a key key information for many many other subjects which will follow anatomy i have to say this is one of the most something like paternoster <coughs> so or the first sura what's important we have two systems supplying the brain the own brain it's a carotid system and vertebrobasilar system we have a four arteries supplying the brain two carotides and two vertebral arteries they then are connected together into the circle which is called circle of villis or circulus arteriosus and this circle maintain the blood flow in the brain this is a protection against the closure of one artery because one artery could be closed the one bridge could be closed and the flow could be then repaired from the other side bypassing the stenosis or occlusion so those are arteries which are supplying the brain so two vertebral arteries forming basilar artery and two carotides and then it's formed the circle of illis then we have also perforate arteries so called arteries which are called central arteries they are anteriores and posteriores and anteriorly they are supplied from 
carotid system and posterior from vertebral basal system. The circus villisi is made by carotides. The carotide is a from carotid channel. And then the carotide is divided. The own circle is made by ant uh, arteria carotic carotis interna interna carotide. Then this is sorry. This is communication between carotide and arteria cerebri posterior, posterior cerebral artery. This communication is called arteria communicans posterior. Then here we have, again, this is posterior artery, this is basilar artery, again, Arteria cerebri posterior, communicans posterior, carotide, then here, arteria cerebri anterior, anterior cerebral artery, this is bridge, which is called arteria communicans anterior and the last one is again arteria carotis uh, arteria cerebri anterior so this is the whole circle the way of circle is a very very important and the circular structure could be drawn easily. So I will start with vertebral arteries. Two vertebral arteries are joined into the basilar artery. Basilar artery is divided into posterior cerebral arteries. From posterior cerebral artery is arising the communication which is called posterior communicating artery. Posterior communicating artery is a branch of internal carotide and internal carotide then is divided into the into the middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery. And here is a bridge which is called arteria, uh, anterior communicating artery joining with the second ACA and here This is ACA, internal carotid artery and middle cerebral artery. So when the blood is flowing inside, the circle is compensating the flow, which is not from the other side. Important is that not all those vessels are of the same caliber, they have not same diameter. Some of them could be very, very tiny or could be absent. Because it is developed uh, very by the complicated way during ontogenase. So this is very important information when we, for example, plan to perform intervention of carotide by endovascular way by surgery. 
So then, when you need to close one artery for a while, so then you have to know if the circle is, is complete. So carotid system. Carotid system is made from middle and anterior cerebral artery. They have uh, several several branches: orbital, frontobasal, pericolosa, callosum marginalis. We will show them also. But important is that uh, anterior cerebral artery is supplying anterior and the middle part of the middle part of the brain. So this is the region which is by anterior this and this. Yeah. So. Interesting and important is that the territory supplied by anterior is a typical for most important, most prone function. It's a, it's a movement of the lower extremities, sensory and motion. So anterior then has branches orbital, frontobasal, pericausa, causa marginalis. Interesting is pericausa. Pericalosa is lying on the corpus callosum and then is following to this part of the brain, which is a parietal. So even parietal, part of parietal lobe is supplied by this anterior. So orbital, frontobasal, and then here we have pericalosa, and callosum marginalis. The middle. Middle is supplying lateral part of the brain, typically very large area of a temporal lobe, but large areas of parietal and temporal lobes also, and a partially occipital lobe. So, they have many, many branches. I like to remember that we have an important central artery. Central artery is in a central sulcus, supplying motor sensoric. And then we have postcentral, precentral, angular. So three arteries. So those are important. Vertebrobasilar system is a little bit easier to understand because this part, its axis of the supply of the brain stem. But the ending branches supplying the dorsal and lower part of the telencephalon also. So, we have the source arteries. Source arteries are vertebral arteries. Vertebral arteries are joined and forming basilary artery and finally it's divided in posterior cerebral arteries. This is a basilary artery. Then we have uh, important branches. Sometimes they are arising from vertebral arteries. Two are arising from vertebral arteries. One is not supplying the brain, supplying the spinal cord, is an anterior spinal artery made by two branches, fused again, and is oriented down. Then, laterally, we have a branch which is very important, which is called pica, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. In, uh, pica is in Czech, do you know? It is pica in Latin, which birth? It's straca. It's a white and, white and black birth. Very frequently seen here. It's very relative to crow. Yeah. So this is pica. 
and it is an artery supplying cerebellar old cerebral parts arising from vertebral artery. The first branch of basilar artery is this, and this is aica, anterior inferior cerebral artery. Then we have pontine arteries or pontine rami supplying pons. And then strong branch which is called which is called cerebelli superior. Cerebella superior artery. So this is a vertebral basilla. And then finally you can see here posterior community communicating artery, which is then forming the circle villus. So vertebral basilar system. Two basilary arteries, uh, two vertebral arteries forming basilary. Here we have anterior spinal artery. Here we have a pica. Here, Aika, Pontine Rami, then one stronger superior cerebral artery, and then one very strong posterior cerebral artery. And from it, we have posterior communicating artery. So this is a schema, and here we have again the rest of the list. Territories of those arteries. I've said the circle of the list is maintaining the flow so then we can see that the terminal branches, middle, anterior and posterior cerebral artery is filled from the villus. But then it could be occluded typically in a ischemic stroke. And in ischemic stroke you can then observe the hyperperfusion or ischemia in the territory of the involved blocked completely occluded artery. So in general, here, this is a territory of a middle cerebral artery. So what is in a middle cerebral artery? When we, in dominant hemisphere, there is a Broca center. Here is a Wernicke. So then the patient, when, ha when he or she has infarction here, he or she has aphasia, the problem of speech. Also here we have central sulcus and this is a sensory and motor cortex. But it is a head and upper extremity. So then the patient could have sometimes only the problem with the innervation of a seventh nerve. Then also it could have problem with motion of the superior extremity, but sometimes could be really preserved the function of a lower extremity. Because what is the territory of the anterior cerebral artery? anterior cerebral artery is a very, very long and covering the lower extremity. So then, when the patient has a only, only impairment of the lower extremity without speech defects, it could be occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery. But mainly, if you can imagine the constitution of a circle of villas. The easiest way of an embolus is 
not to the anterior because the flow is higher into the middle cerebral artery is larger, higher, larger territory. So then typical localization of an embolus, which could be arising from a heart, from a carotid plaque, is in the middle cerebral artery. Or sometimes it could be occlusion of the whole carotid. So then the patient very frequently has a hemiparesis, aphasia, hemiplegia, etc. So the last territory is a posterior cerebral artery. So then when you have occluded posterior cerebral artery, the way here is also easy because the embolus could pass through the vertebral artery to the basal artery and then close here artery somewhere. It could affect this region. And what is here? What's the problem? Which could be seen here. Yes, it's a primary and secondary visual cortex. So this patient has problem with vision. Yeah? So this is a typical, please remember that the most typical of the ischemia from anterior carotid circulation is that a patient has aphasia and hemiplegia or hemiparesis. On the other side, the posterior circulation, when it is in a cortical region, this is a visual problem. But a visual problem is not centered and sometimes could be caused, by the way, uh, from eyeball to the visual cortex. So then, the last part is, uh, yeah, here is a vertebral basilary territory, this part. This part is very problematic because it could be occluded the whole uh, basilary artery and then uh, the superior territory could be supplied by circle of villus. The lover, probably not. The patient could be in a very severe situation. It could have some impairment of uh, consciousness, then also could have the problems with the heart rates or other things. And um, uh, then it could be deep coma. And uh, the problem could be that the uh, supratentorial centers are impaired. So, stroke. Remember, please, stroke, 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 stroke. Because even if your age, in your age, in your colleague, could be problem. When you have a patient with a stroke, he is not able to call himself, herself, the eight. So then it's important when the patient, when they are colleague, your mother, grandma, some other people, could suddenly have the problem with speech, suddenly the problem with emotion. So then directly to be called first aid, because we can then, here is the example, this is CT angiography, showing here the occlusion of middle cerebral artery. We can... Then, using catheter, insert the special instrument inside and this blocking embolus here, remove outside. And then you can see how we can treat the patient and spare him, her, those functions. So uh, this aid is very well organized in our country, I have to say one of the best in Europe. Also in Germany very well, because those patients could reach the treatment in several, I have to say, tens of minutes in larger cities and from whole territory inside the two hours. And then we can save the very large number of neurons and then to support patients to be able to live alone without any support. So it is important. Please remember it. The last pair of informations. So venous system of the brain. Venus is the outflow of the brain. It's also important. We can distinguish four systems of the brain. Venous system. Superficial. This is a superficial venous system covering the brain from outside, typically those veins lying in, in superarachnoid space. Then we have a deep system. 
deep cistern is outflow of the tissue from the tissue which are localized in the deep so typically thalamus hypothalamus uh, basal ganglia or the deep structures of brainstem then we have a collectors which are called sinus dura matris which are localized in duplicatures of a dura mater and then we have emissaria emissaria are communications between intracranial and extracranial veins which are mainly not very important in some special situations could be so deep cerebral veins those deep cerebral veins are taking the blood especially from ventricular spaces from choroid plexus because choroid plexus has to pro, uh, provide the secretion of the cerebral spinal fluid and we know that it's a half liter a day so then the flow through it is a very high so then the outflow from vein is a very, also very high so the system of cerebral deep cerebral veins consists of thalamus striate veins so they are draining basal ganglia and thalamus and also they are taken choroid veins this vein which is collecting the blood from thalamus basal ganglia and choroid plexus of lateral and, and third ventricle is called vena cerebri interna internal cerebral vein this is this vein then we have vein which is called vena cerebri profunda vena cerebri profunda takes the blood from medial parts of the brain from those which are subiculum etc rinencephal then they are connected here and also here is a one vein which is called basal vein basal vein is draining blood from mesencephalon and a part of the uh, cerebellum and those veins are then joined in a very very short vein which is seen here yeah here is a middle cerebral vein deep and here rosenthal basal vein and this vein about one centimeter long is a called vena magna galeni galen vein great cerebral vein this is the central deep venous trunk which enters then the system of superficial sinuses so this is a deep system superficial brain veins superficial brain veins collecting the blood from the cerebral cortex and they are following the sulci and then they are typically seen on the surface they are entering partially the large collectors which are sinuses but they have they are three important communications between those systems they are forming something like mercedes-benz sign and this mercedes-benz sign is made from anastomotic vein which is called superior trollardi labe inferior and superficial medial cerebral vein vena cerebri media superficialis this is communication towards to sinuses this is a superficial sagittal sinus this is a transversal sinus and this is a cavernous which is deep along or around the thoracic cell
So this is communication which supports the outflow from the brain and communication between those systems because also here it is compensated when some of them could be occluded. So dural sinuses. Dural sinuses. We have some of them, they are very, very large and important. This is uh, the complete list of them. Not complete. One is missed, this one. Occipitalis. So, then dural sinuses. This one, the largest one in Falk's cerebri, side by side with the calva, is a superficial, uh, superficial, superior sagittal sinus. This one is inferior sagittal sinus. It is joined with great cerebral vein, galeni, and then is forming the stride sinus rectus. The point where they are joined together, the composition is a variable, joint sinus rectus and sinus sagittalis superior, and then division into two transverse sinuses is called confluence. This is confluence. From this is able the blood to flow the two ways to the transversus sinus, then it is going into the sigmoid and forming then the bulb of internal jugular vein and then is forming jugular veins and jugular veins are going side by side like with internal carotide in the neck region and then with a common carotide and then forming superior vena cava after confluence with, with uh, subclavian vein. So those are which are the straightway outside. Then we have to mention also those which are medially localized. Yeah. And what is it? This is this one and the second one. Those are cavernos. Why they are cavernos? Because inside there are localized very important structures, which internal carotide is going through it and multiple nervi, which are localized here. So which nervi? Third, fourth, part, fifths, and sixth nerve. So those cavernous sinuses are connected together with intercavernous sinuses and then they are connected also with petrosus superior and inferior with sigmoid sinus. And also here we have the way which is a this vein is a superficial middle cerebral vein. So it is communicating also with the superficial system, with anastomotic. Here you can see this. Mercedes sign again. So when we look from the down, the cover nose Cavernous sinus is at the base of the brain and inside the whole is what is this structure? This is a 
infundibulum, so hypophysis, is in the middle. And here are many veins, and also there are the veins which are, take, are taken blood from the orbit, and this is communication with uh, superior orbital fissure, with orbital veins, and then with inferior orbital fission with the veins of a pterygoid plexus. So this is the way where is important possibility of the spread of the infection from stomatological and orofacial infections. So at the end, the image of the venous system. I will be glad if you will be able to draw the e, uh, easier the system. So the easier schema is this schema. This is a super superior sagittal sinus. Here is a confluence. And this is a transversus sigmoid. And he is internal jugular vein. This is the main schema. Then we have inferior sagittal sinus creating here rectus sinus. And here is a what is here? It's a great cerebral vein, galen. And this is taken internal cerebral vein and deep middle cerebral vein so they are those are deep and then we have also cavernous sinuses and those cavernous sinuses they have a communication with the orbit. And also here, this is communication with Petros. Superior and inferior. So this is an easy schema of the veins. So then we have a veins here, veins which are going into the, into the super, from the superficial into the sinuses. So what about the communication? So the communication, the Mercedes-Benz star is labe, anastomotic vein, which is called inferior, this is a trollard. Superior. And this is a superficial middle cerebral vein. And this is a way to the cavernous, transversus, and here superior sagittal sinus. So they are superficial. So, that's all for today.